I just want to welcome you to the second event in the MA in Liberal Studies public lecture series. Thank you so much for coming. And um, this is a public, this public lecture series is designed to allow people on campus to see our wonderful faculty and the amazing research they're doing. And we have our very special guest tonight, Dr. Jermaine Archer, who will be uh, speaking about his own research on Frederick Douglass, and you'll hear more about him shortly. I just wanted to say a quick thanks on behalf of the MALS program and the public lecture series to the provost, Dr. Patrick O'Sullivan, for funding this series, um, to the associate provost, Duncan Corliss, who is going to be introducing our speaker in a few moments, and our wonderful secretary, Anna Brewer, who helped so much to make this event happen. Thank you so much. And without further ado, Dr. Corliss. Um, so good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce your speaker this evening. And um, I'll introduce him in a second, but I, I want to say that with respect to um, what I, some of what I think we're going to hear tonight, it's, I'm very fascinated by the link between self-identity and struggle and who gets to control the narrative, right? So, so the idea of what I think we're about to hear this evening is a very intriguing subject matter to me, right? Um, if you've been paying attention to what's going on in politics right now, there's some debate about what are the identities of some candidates that are actually getting ready to run for president, potentially, right? Um, we, we have an African-American female, and people are questioning whether or not she's African-American, right? I, it's the weirdest thing. But, but in any event, um, Dr. Jermaine Archer is Associate Professor and Chair of the American Studies and Media and Communications Department here at SUNY Old Westbury. Um, his book, Antebellum, Slave Narratives, Political and Cultural Expressions of Africa appeared with Rutledge Press in 2009. He is presently working on a manuscript, Visual Insurgency, Recasting the Art of Emancipation. So that's the image part of this in terms of identity and the struggle, right? Um, that investigates how some images of African-American emancipation festivals and parades during and shortly after Reconstruction ran counter to the pervasive minstrel caricature depictions of African-Americans' public sphere uh, performative culture during the antebellum period. Uh, the project examines the production of images by African-American sketch artists who worked uh, for the burgeoning African-American pictorial press in the second half of the 19th century and also closely explores the ways African-Americans in Virginia strongly urged the famous Civil War artist, Winslow Homer, to paint them dressing for their annual festival known as Junkanoo for his 1877 oil painting, Dressing for Carnival, Junkanoo. Um, without further ado, I'm going to just call Dr. Archer to the podium. Please welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. Yes, I really appreciate that, your, your sensibility of where the research is going um, as, a, as a scientist that you were able to get that, so appreciate that. Um, thank you all for coming here on, on Valentine's Day, and I know it's two basketball games this evening, the last ones of the season. Don't run out of here, <laughs> um, but I, I appreciate you being here. And I, I want to send a, a huge thank you to Professor Amanda Friskin, um, director of the MAUS program, who has started this public lecture series. Um, her, her work 
um, and her passion for American studies and, and for the MAS program um, is, is amazing to watch. I, I want to thank um, Jamie Jones, Mike Kinane, um, for all of their help in, in putting this event together. The, the images in, um, are, are largely are, 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 um, a result of Jamie's hard work. Um, and as Mandy mentioned, our, our um, treasured secretary in the American Studies Department, a new brewer who has um, made this event possible in many ways, and of course, chart rolls and facilities. Um, so I want to begin with the quote from Douglas. Many things touched me and employed my thoughts and activities between the years 1881 and 1891. I am willing to speak of them. Like most men who give the world their autobiographies, I wish my story to be told as favorably myself as it can be with a due regard to truth. I do not wish it to be imagined by any that I am insensible to the singularity of my career or to the peculiar, peculiar relation that I sustain to the history of my time and country. Frederick Douglass, 1881, Life and Time. So you think about 1881, how many years passed, 1865, so that slavery has been over for quite some time. I start with this quote because it captures the essence of how Douglas claimed ownership of his own story in his own way and in his own time. Douglas decided to become the most photographed figure of the 19th century. And through the publications of autobiographies, newspapers, speeches, and novels, asserted his voice as, as he wished his story to be told truthfully. He wanted nothing of the imagined type when it came to his story. Not the most photographed African American of the 19th century, but the most photographed American of the 19th century. He was keenly aware of the caricatured imagery of infantile, dim-witted, sambo-like forms of black folk running through the press, theatrical forms and literature. He sought to avoid the snapshot limited view of society and was unrelenting and unforgiving in his approach to tell it like it is, to borrow from the title of Gil Noble's public affairs television program on issues within the black community from 1968 to 2011. Actually, it was Douglas who in many ways laid the foundation for biographical and communal narratives of black folks to be told like it is. All after him who tell it like it is are standing on the broad, broad and magnific magnificent shoulders of Douglas. If we're using social media to capture, archive, and curate our own stories today, do we tell it like it is? And can we tell when others are not telling, telling it like it is? To what degree does it matter if one is telling it like it is? So let's walk through, listen to, and slow down the music as we enter the Douglas Affair to see how one of the most prolific figures of the 19th century exhausted all efforts to tell it like it is. <laughs> so he writes three autobiographies, one in 1845, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. That's the one we're most familiar with, a small volume well before, 20 years before the Civil War ends and slavery ends. Then he published another, he publishes another one, My Bondage and My Freedom in 55, 10 years later. Both of these texts, huge financial successes, both here and abroad. These two texts are important because they have received large attention from scholars in the public both here and abroad. However, his last text, which was published in 1881, has received, um, has received the greatest attention. Life and Times, a volume of nearly 600 pages that was republished in 1882 and republished in 1883 again. So here's where the images really sort of come into play with Douglas's last narrative. 
So he's 63, and we were talking about how he lived throughout most of, a large part of the 19th century, this Douglas. Born around 1818, they celebrate his birthday today on Valentine's Day. So happy birthday, Frederick Douglass. We'll talk about how I think that that's relevant, even though we don't know definitively when he was born, right? So he's 63 when he begins to work on Life and Times, which included illustrations, even though Douglass had expressed his firm objections to this. He wrote to the editor of Park Publishing House before the book appeared, quote, I ask and insist as I have a right to do, that an edition of the book shall be published without illustrations for northern circulation. The contract does not permit you to load the book with all manner of coarse and shocking woodcuts, such as they may be found in the newspapers of the day. I have no pleasure whatever in the book and shall not have while engravings remain. Douglas threatened to take legal action to prevent its publication before reaching an agreement under which some copies were released without illustration. So he takes issue with the first edition, which included a number of illustrations, which he feel did not depict him accurately or the masses of Africa. So I would like us to imagine that we are visiting Douglas's social media page, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. But this one, he didn't create, perhaps a robot, of some other unknown or known force that was simply not Frederick Douglass. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Douglass has been hacked with spyware, malicious coding, and unforgivable viruses in which the stakes of perception and reality are high. As Douglass challenged those who desired to undercut his representation and image, he was on the fast track to creating a new page, an accurate page with accurate images of himself and others. Let us appreciate Douglas as he was at the forefront of the selfie movement in the 1800s. And while he may have not received comparative likes at the time, many comparative likes, it is imperative that we now begin to give him his proper acknowledgement and likes. For he wished that uplifting imagery of black folk would go viral. Douglas, the last time he saw his mother, this first image. So all of the images here appear in Life and Times. So I'd like us to walk through these images and think about the presentation of these images, which he took issue with as it relates to the text. So his mother, when I'll be flipping through the book here, um, his mother only saw him a few times. So if you, those of us who are familiar with the first narrative that this is a popular theme, right? His mother, he recalls his mother giving him a heart, a heart, happy Valentine's Day, a heart-shaped ginger cake, and calls him Valentine's. Perhaps that's why he decided to celebrate his birthday on Valentine's Day. And tells, his mother tells his Aunt Kathy, who's the lady holding him, because his mother lives a distance and only visits him a few times, his mother tells Aunt Kathy to start treating him better because Aunt Kathy is not the kindest to Douglas, right? He loses her when he's eight or nine but has fond memories of her. Quote Douglas, these little glimpses of my mother obtained under such circumstances and against such odds, meager as they were, are stamped upon my memory. She was tall and finely proportioned, a dark, glossy complexion with regular features and almost, and among the slaves was remarkably sedate and dignified. There is in Pritchett's natural history of man, the head of her figure on page 57, the features of which so resemble my mother that I often recur to it with something of feelings that I suppose others experience when looking upon the likeness of their own departed ones. This is the picture in the text that he's referring to. The lady who's leaving is the image of Douglas, is the image of his mother that he took issue with. So he didn't want this image in the text. But I should mention that anti-slavery abolitionist art was actually quite progressive when we compare it to the more pervasive 
common minstrel caricature forms. But it was not progressive enough for Douglass. When we compared it, we get the visual, right? So Douglass is trying to shape the visual narrative in really important ways, so much so that he's threatening legal action. Also, commenting on his mother, on his grandmother, he gives a sort of similar description in wanting to depict her as someone who was elegant, as somebody who was refined. So, quote, advanced in years as she was, evident from the more than one gray hair, which peeped, which peeped from between the ample and graceful folds of her newly and smoothly ironed bandana turban. Grandmother was yet a woman of power and spirit. She was remarkably straight in figure and elastic and muscular in movement. Talking about an African in the 1900s. The whooping of old Barney, another image in life and times. Barney and his son take care of Colonel Lloyd's horses. So Colonel Lloyd was the planter, the master of Douglas in Maryland. Interestingly, later in Life and Times, again published in 81, he talks about giving the keynote speech in 1876, Douglas, and it relates to this image. He talks about giving the keynote speech in 1876 for the Freedmen's Monument to Lincoln in Washington, in which he objected to the free slaves who were depicted in kneeling positions. So this image of Barney kneeling is an actual account. But does she want this image imprinted on the minds of the viewing public? He describes Barney as Manly, but likely found the image problematic. His comments on Barney, quote, old Barney was a fine looking, portly old man of brownish complexion and a respectable and dignified bearing. He was much devoted to his profession of caring for the horses and held his offices as an honorable one. Here is some commentary on Douglas spe speaking, writing specifically about Neely in 1881. One of the most Heartening, saddening, and humiliating scenes I ever witnessed was the whipping of old Barney by Colonel Lloyd. These two men were both advanced in years. They were the silver locks of the master and the bald and toil-worn brow of the slave, superior and inferior here, powerful and weak here, but equals before God. Uncover your head, said the imperious master. He was Barney's jacket. Down on your knees, down up the old shine and his aged knees on the old cold, damp ground in this humble and debasing attitude that the master to whom he had devoted the best years and the best strength of his life came forward and laid on 30 lashes with his horse whip. I'll skip. I owe it to truth, however, to say that this was the first and last time I ever saw a slave compelled to kneel to receive a whip. It says this in 1881, so it's just, but if it's an image, and this is before we get the proliferation of mass media, that this is the media that leaves an imprint nationally. But this is only the one time that he's noticed the slave leaving. He's trying to control the visual landscape because the political implications, the stakes are high. Douglas in literacy. Miss All teaching him to read a popular, a popular, I, I, I think, te you know, theme in the book that scholars have co covered um, and, and talked about a great deal. Um, but I think, and when I first looked at these images, um, in fact, Professor Friskin and myself were, were fortunate enough this summer um, to participate as faculty fellows for the National Endowment of the Humanities, their visual, the Institute on the Visual Culture of the Civil War. So we were, we were um, privileged to be a part of that. And we, the part of my presentation was looking at these, these narratives, but at that time, and I'll be candid with you all, so I appreciate having the opportunity to, 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 to push my research along, I was unaware that Douglas was, was really 
um, disillusioned and upset with the publishers for including images, right? So I had, I had looked at these images as sort of a, a progression in, in um, you know, from the, the menstrual forms that you look at this image, what's wrong with this, right? That, that it looks fine. But piercing more deeply into it, that, it's, it, that, it's, that it has a host of, 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 of problems, I think. It, Douglas thought. Douglas was learned, Douglas became learned in a multitude of ways. And he viewed himself as a self-made man. In fact, he later crafted and delivered versions of his speech with that title, self-made man during tours in New York and Illinois and Michigan and Wisconsin. In fact, Douglas, you'll recall, if you read the first narrative, he retrieved discarded pages of the Bible just to study his letters from the gutter. He engaged in cunning games with white youth to learn, to, to learn under the guise of improving his penmanship. Yet this image depicts the agency only of Miss All and positions Douglas as receiving his education, not claiming his education. Such visual tropes and illustrations were common in anti-slavery circles of slaves being given their freedom rather than taking it under their own resolve. Here's an image, I just wanted to show this image um, from the Society of Affecting the Abolitionists of the Slave Trade, Josiah Wedge with Am I Not a Man and a Brother which was produced by the, the, the anti-slavery societies in London, influencing the American anti-slavery societies and becoming um, quite common in anti-slavery iconography. On the surface, again, one may look at this image and say that nothing's wrong with it. But African-American abolitionists and some white abolitionists took issue that the slave was kneeling, that he was passive, that he was not standing. So Douglas quite aware of how this theme was contested. Douglas found in the woods by Sandy Jenkins. Again, let's consider the visual motif of Douglas not standing. If you recall the first narrative, Douglas runs away, he escapes, he meets Sandy Jenkins in the woods. He considers Sandy Jenkins a genuine, Afri a genuine African of African root memory, who's versed in the medicinal curative pro properties, healing properties of roots and herbs. So Douglas is being flogged by Kobe. Kobe's the notorious slave breaker. So Sandy says, if you put this root, this talisman on your right side, you'll never be flogged again. And Douglas considers this point a turning point in his life where the slave becomes a man. As he encounters as he encounters, when, Sandy's appro when Sandy approaches, Douglas is actually laying down, right? So that he's getting up to sort of greet. He's, he's nervous, he's, he's sleeping in the woods, it's dark, but he's getting up. But, but why not, maybe Douglas would not have, it. Douglas didn't want any image, right? Because he didn't think that they could get it right. But if, if an image was to be inserted with um, that, that sort of depicts this exchange with him, with he and Sandy, why not have him stand, right? You know, why does it sort of have to be him cowering, um, reminding one almost of the visual narrative? Am I not a woman? Am I not a man? I'm pleading. You give me, you, you have given me, you have given me freedom. I didn't run away. I wasn't a maroon. I didn't fight for the Civil War. That it was given to me by the Emancipation Proclamation, right? A false, well, you know, I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Thank you all for laughing at that. Um, <laughs> um, gore shooting Dendi. Okay. So I want to read this passage and discuss the image. Among the murder of a young colored man was Bill Dendi. He was a powerful fellow, full of animal spirits, and one of the most valuable of Colonel Lloyd's slaves. In some way, I know not what he offended Mr. Austin Gore, and in accordance with the usual custom, and the latter undertook the flogging. He had given him but a few stripes when Denby broke away from him. 
plunged into the creek and standing there with the water up to his neck, refused to come out. Whereupon, for his refusal, Gore shot him dead. It was said that he did not obey the last call. He should shoot him. When the last call was given, Denby stood still his ground, and Gore, without further parley or making any further effort to induce obedience, raised his gun deliberately to his face, took deadly aim at his standing victim, and with one click of the gun, the mangled body sank out of sight, and only his warm and blood marked the place where he stood. The fiendish murder produced as it could, not help doing a tremendous sensation. The slaves were panic stricken and how the alarm. You might see some slaves in the background, but we don't get a sense. It's a woodcut. It, it lacks detail. Again, if you look at the visual plane, this is this this may be a visual interpretation of what happened, but he's not exhibiting any agency in this picture. He looks defeated. He ran away from war, and he was defiant in not coming out of the water. He looks timid. Driven to jail for running away, another image in life and times. Just as we were all completely tired and about ready to start towards St. Michael's and thence to jail, Mrs. Betsy Freeland, mother to William, who was much attached after the Southern fashion to Henry and John, they haven't been reared from childhood in her house, came to the kitchen door. Miss, Miss Freeland was a, was a white woman, came to the kitchen door with her hands full of biscuits, for we had not had our breakfast that morning, and divided them between Henry and John. I'll skip down. Oh, no. This done, the lady made the following parting address to me, pointing her bony finger at me. You devil, you yellow devil, it was you who put into the heads of Henry and John to run away. But for you, you long-legged yellow devil, Henry and John would never have thought of running away. I gave the lady a look. This is Douglas. I gave the lady a look, which called forth from her a certain a scream of mingled wrath and terror. She slammed the kitchen door and went in, leaving me with the rest in hands as harsh as our own broken voice. Yes, I want to skip. I was in the hands of moral vultures. No, no. Could the kind leader have been riding along the main road? This is important, because this is not pictured in this image. But if the, if the image is juxtaposed with the text, what leaves a longer impression? We watch movies, we consume media. Could the kind leader have been riding along the main road to or from Easton that morning, his eye would have met a painful sight. He would have seen five young men guilty of no crime save that of preferring liberty or slavery, drawn along the public highway, firmly bound together, tramping through dust and heat, barefooted and bareheaded, fastened at three Fastened the three strong horses, whose riders were armed with pistols and daggers, and on their way to prison with, like felons and suffering every possible insult from the crowds of idle, vulgar people who clustered round and heartlessly make their failure to escape the occasion for all manner of sport. We don't get this in that image. So here, um, his present home in Washington, um, Douglas purchases this huge home. Um, I think it's like a six room or nine room house. And one of the reasons I think that he might have taken issue with this image is because Douglas often had to respond to what he, he thought were false accusations about his character, um, he, at one point during Reconstruction, becomes president of the Freedmen's uh, Bank, which, which loses money. And in the press, in, in the mainstream press, and even sometimes in the African-American press, they accuse Douglas of, of 
you know, um, not being responsible with his money and, and really uh, living off the profits of his activism. And he responded to that in the newspaper, and he also responded to that in his narrative, right? So again, if we don't have context that Douglas told the publishers, please do not, please do not put any illustrations in my texting. Again, we open the, the slave narrative, and we look at this, and oh, that's nice, right? He, Douglas amassed some wealth, but we don't have context there, right? And I have a few more slides, just two or three more images here, then I'll conclude, and we can open it up. For Q and A. <laughs> so finding the mob in Indiana. Again, I want to read a passage here and think about Douglas and how he might have taken issue with it. As soon as we began to speak, a mob of about sixty. <laughs> 60 of the roughest characters I ever looked upon ordered us through its leaders to be silent, threatening us if we were not with violence. We, att we attempted to dissuade them, but they had not come to parlay but to fight and were well armed. They tore down the platform on which we stood, assaulted Mr. White, and knocked out several of his teeth, dealt a heavy blow on Mr. White, striking him on the back part of the head, badly cutting his scalp, in feeling him to the ground, feeling him to the ground. Now here's undertaking to fight my way through Douglas, the crowd with the stick which I had caught in the melee, I attracted the fury of the mob, which laid me prostrate on the ground under a torment of blows. So this just hit me right now. He's saying in this instance that he was actually laid on the ground, ultimately. But here they have him standing up. Leaving me thus with my right hand broken and in a state of unconsciousness, the mobocrats hastily mounted their horses and rode to Andersonville, where most of them resided. I was soon... Skip a little bit to hear. Um, he just talks about that his hand, his right hand, had never recovered its strength, its full strength and dexterity, right? Douglas was uh, a commissioner to Santo Domingo. Um, we find Douglas um, really having international experience. He was appointed the minister resident and council general to Haiti on July 1889. And he becomes an important person in diplomatic relations with, with, with the then Haitian president, Louis Florville Hypolite. Douglas, I think, because Haiti represented for him um, the first slave nation to, to, to free itself from colonial rule, that, that it, it represented an example. Um, but, I, but the image, I think, is Douglas might have found problematic if one notices, and I'm not sure, but whose hat is that on the floor? I mean, it might be ambiguous, right, because I think three of the gentlemen, three of the Five gentlemen are holding hats, but certainly Douglas is not. So why is his hat on the floor? What does a hat symbolize in terms of being a gentleman in the 19th century? It is sometimes, this is Douglas, as his, as his appointment to being the commissioner in Haiti, it has sometimes been asked, why am, I, why am I called honorable? My appointment to this council must explain this, as it explains the impartiality of General Grant, though I fear it will hardly sustain the handle to my name as well as it does the former part of this proposition. Two more images, all of the images, I'm showing you all of the images that are actually in the text. This one, Douglas also um, served as a marshal at the inauguration of President Garfield. In all of them, he was later a recorder of deeds. So he's doing a number of these first. 
for African Americans, right? This escaped slave. Um, I'm not sure that I find anything necessarily problematic with, with, with this image, um, and I don't know. I think this might be the one image, as I'm reading the text, where Douglas might have been okay with. You know, he talks about this event and how grand it was in a certain respectability. Um, and it seems to be sort of, this is the, the one single image where I think it, it captures that well. Um, but this last one, what I want to conclude on, <laughs> revisits his old home. So Douglas had lived this long life like we started, and he returns to the Lloyd Plantation. Um, I forget the year, but it, it, it's some years after. And he's in front of the grave of Colonel Lloyd, if you can make that out. So this master, and it looks like he's reflecting, he's pondering. But I want to read the paragraph and, and, and see if we can sense, is there something problematic here? And I, um, well, I, I, I'll say it at the end. So notable among the, the tombs were those of Admiral Buchanan, who commanded the Merrimack in the action of Hampton Roads with the monitor March 8, 1862. There was also pointed out to me the grave of a Massachusetts man named Mr. Page, a teacher in the family who I had often seen and wondered what he could be thinking about as he silently paced up and down the garden walks, always alone, for he associated neither with Captain Anthony, Mr. McDermott, nor the overseers. He seemed to be one by himself. I believe he originated somewhere near Greenfield, Massachusetts, and members of his family will perhaps learn for the first time from these lines the place of his burial, for I have had intimation that they knew little about him after he was once left home. Colonel Lloyd is not mentioned in that paragraph. Colonel Lloyd's tomb is not mentioned in this section but that Colonel Lloyd's tomb in glaring fashion is presented to the reader. Of course, I think Douglas's hair must have stood up on the back of his neck as he was, as he was reading these images. This text is nearly 600 pages, and he considered it his finest work. 1881 is first published, and then as a result, they published one in 1882 and then another one in 1883. So Douglas gives us a view to how to take ownership of one's own story, how to add to one's story, how to avoid the snapshot angle, capturing stories and narratives, how to assert one's voice, how to tell it like it is. It should also be noted that he published a short novel, The Heroic Slave, a fictional account of Madison Washington, the leader of the 1841 Creole ship mutiny for publication that he then sold to raise funds for the Frederick Douglass's newspaper. There's one paragraph I want to conclude with, and it's a quote from Douglas, because Douglas says it best. And then we'll leave it up, then we'll open it up for QA if we have time. I think. Okay. I have nearly reached the end of the period. It's the last paragraph in a book. So how meaningful is that? It's the last paragraph in the last autobiography of his book, in the last edition. So in many ways, it's, it's not his final work, but his, it's his final work on identity and notions of self, right? So I have nearly reached the end of the period of which in the beginning I proposed, I pr proposed to write. And should I leave to see at the end of another decade, it is not at all likely that I should feel disposed to add another word to this volume. I may therefore make the concluding chapter of this part of my autobiography. Contemplating my life as a whole, I have to say that although it has at times been dark and stormy, and I have met with hardships from which other men have been exempted, yet my life has in many respects been remarkably full of sunshine and joy. That's the blues, right? Sunshine, sadness, joy. Servitude, persecution, false friends, Desertion and deprecation have not robbed my life of happiness or made it burn. He was fighting against the angry black man motif back then, in the 1900s, that he wasn't angry, that he was okay. But that if he, that his anger was okay, that his anger was okay, if he was angry, and that he should be allowed to emote. Servitude, mm. 
I had been and still am especially fortunate and may well indulge sentiments of warmest gratitude for the allotments of life that have fallen to me. While I cannot boast of having accomplished great things in the world, he said, <laughs> I gotta repeat that, right? This humble. While I cannot boast of having accomplished great things in the world, I cannot, on the other hand, feel that I have lived in vain. From first to last, I have in large measure shared respect and confidence of my fellow men. I have had the happiness of possessing many precious and long enduring friendships with good men and women. I have been the, re the recipient of many honors among which my unsought appointment by President Benjamin Harrison to the officer, the Minister of Council General to represent the United States at the capital of Haiti and my equally unsought appointment by President Florville to represent Haiti among all the civilized nations of the globe at the world's Columbian Exposition, a crowning honors to my home, my long career, and a fitting and happy close, close to the whole of my public life. That he ends talking about Haiti. His last comment is talking about Haiti. That Haiti shouldn't be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. What's that? I think that's intense. Yeah, no, Chester, I, I thought the same thing in terms of sort of the visual hierarchy there, um, that he's standing above. And it, I think that this would have been an image that he was okay with, but he wanted none of them, right? I mean, to, to say that this was okay would have been so much good. That's what I said. Right? I got yeah. You. I got you there. Yeah, yeah. He, he wasn't doing a sort of critical analysis about the images, get him out of there, right? Yeah. But yeah, that these are sort of more redeeming ones, I think. Yeah. Good point. Um, the other image is going back to the plantation. The, um, and one of the th things that follow. Okay. Second to last. Oh, okay. Right. Sorry. Second to last. So this one right here. Another point is that he looks very solid looking at the old master, which is another point that I don't think that, that was ever his sentiment. Mm. And, and so I thought it was interesting that the uh, publisher decided to have a picture like this. Yeah, I think so. Right. That that. It, it's such a relationship rooted in, rooted in conflict, um, you know, and even when he becomes a man, like his, it's him against Colonel Lloyd, and, and even when he, it's him against Covey, it's Colonel Lloyd that is sort of the representative um, larger nemesis, if you will. And, and so one gets the sense that he's, he's thinking of a long lost loved one here, right? Yeah, 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 no. yeah, the, I just happened to be lecturing my class on Douglas in Pleasanton, Virginia. Douglas calls his freedom in, 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 in England. I'm surprised there is no depiction of the sense of the nation. What did you say about England? I'm sorry. He called his freedom. Oh, when they, when they vote the letter? Exactly. When, when they sort of, sort of formally. Exactly. Um, he, he got his freedom when he ran away, right? <laughs> That's when he got his freedom. So as soon as he runs away, and that's how he would want it articulated, right? And so, um, yeah, that you know he's away, and Thomas all decides to free him now that he's been away forever. With give me some money, right? If you if, and now Douglas is technically and formally free, um, but that right? So yeah, why aren't there any depictions of him abroad? Sure. This is black guy who speaks well, all the great fluid, and you know, he captures this, this international audience in England. Right, right, yeah. Um, that is interesting. That is interesting why there are no pictures, illustrations of him 
abroad, right? Yeah. But that, that I guess that there is one where he's on the vessel headed to Haiti. But yeah, that, that I don't know why. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Dad. That's what, and that's why we have the images, like the photographs that are up here, to really look at how he wanted himself to be depicted. And he understood that the that, that images up north that we were debating slavery, right? I mean, Jim Crow comes in shortly thereafter, and, and congressional Republican re Reconstruction doesn't last, you know, for for beyond the sort of decade there. So, yeah, I think that he is at the early sort of forefront of wanting to get the narrative right. So I, the social media analogy um, is a neat one to engage, but, but I think there's a lot, of, a, a lot of merit there, right? Yeah. What strikes me looking at some of these images, this one and um, the one, the parlor scene where he's in the same um, and also several of them, it's just how sentimental they are. They're very much antithetical. see these sort of images in, in the newspapers? Or we're, 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 we're... In books, I think. OK. What strikes me, books from the antebellum. Yeah, but that it, it, it stops, that it, it sort of begins to change course post-bellum. Yeah, that he would take issue, that he would certainly take issue with this sort of stock imagery that, that doesn't give perspective or, or full form. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we don't know about, we don't know who the artists were, you know, all we know, we know the press, and we know that they, that there was a decision by the publishers to insert these images. Um, and I, sort of thinking about Mandy's question, that there's such a, a broad visual um, landscape from which to choose, sort of visual, um, you know, large repository of just visual, sentimental imagery or African-Americans who are caricatured. And in, in interesting ways, Tom, if you look at like the whipping of old Barney, the artist might not even know that he's drawing on and like, right, these images. Because these, these images are on teacups, they're on tobacco boxes, they're on spoons, they're on forks. These images are marketed. Right? So anti-slavery becomes business, right? So it's a good thing in one way because it's saying that they should be free, right? But it still depicts them in a way that, that um, potentially is crippling, right? That's the point, right? And I think that, 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 that Douglas would have taken issue with that as a number of black abolitionists did, right? 